Why News with Angelo Castro the Third, William Theo, and Darlene Basingan. Good evening. In the Senate Blue Ribbon Committee hearing today, former Health Secretary Janet Garin denies corruption in the purchase of the 3.5 billion peso worth of the controversial anti-dengue vaccine. Here's why from Monoxon. I categorically deny any wrongdoing. I am not involved in any corruption and I am willing to be investigated. This has been the statement of former Health Secretary Janet Garin during the investigation of the Senate Blue Ribbon Committee on the government's controversial use of Dengvaxia vaccine in its mass immunization program. Garin insisted that the vaccine was approved by the Food and Drug Administration or FDA and the Formulary Executive Council or FEC. Garin stood firm that the purchase of the 3.5 billion pesos worth of anti-dengue vaccine went through proper process. She also clarifies her visit to Paris, France, where she and other government officials talked to the pharmaceutical French company Sanofi Pasteur. Garin says they talked with Sanofi to discuss if the Philippine government can buy the vaccines at a cheaper price. Kung may mali siya yun, bakit ako magdadala ng mga career officials? Bakit ako magdadala ng taga-European Union? Bakit ako magdadala ng taga-Department of Foreign Affairs? However, members of the FEC denies approving the Vaxia and claims they were coerced to release requirements for the said vaccines. A political decision has been made by, by a higher committee and that we as the formulary being a technical and advisory group are then advised to uh, provide some requirements or some additional uh, uh, measures in order to protect the children who will be vaccinated. Meanwhile, former DOH Chief Pauline Obial and incumbent Health Secretary Francisco Duque believe that the then administration should have not made Dengvaxia vaccination a priority project. Would you say that Dengue is a priority right away? It's important, but is it a priority? Uh, I don't think uh, it's a priority. According to the Department of Budget and Management, it was former President Benigno Aquino III who approved the purchase of Dengvaxia. Ubial, meanwhile, claims she was pressured to implement a new the anti-dengue vaccine program, which she previously halted. She said some lawmakers want to push through with the vaccination in Region 7 in Cebu. I wanted to stop that, to save the Filipino 2 billion people. But people, even in Congress, were telling me you will go to, to jail, doctora, if you do not implement this program. Senate Blue Ribbon Committee Chairman Dick Gordon, meanwhile, said he noticed the anti-dengue vaccination program was launched in regions with huge voting population. This includes the National Capital Region, Regions 3 and 4A, and Cebu. We do not introduce new vaccines during election year because no matter how good that vaccine is, the introduction during election year will taint it as a hidden agenda of somebody. So that is why we do not mix health and politics. Senator Gordon says the Blue Ribbon Committee will probe next the alleged political influence in the purchase and immediate launching of the anti-dengue vaccine program. The Senate Committee recommends to the Department of Health and Department of Education the immediate identification of children who receive the vaccine and to teach their parents of what to do in case of noticing symptoms. The Senate Blue Ribbon Committee will continue the hearing on Thursday. Mon Hoxon, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. The Philippine Children's Medical Center began yesterday its mandatory profiling of children who received the controversial Dengvaxia. The hospital, meanwhile, apologized to the individuals who were affected by the controversy. John Anno will tell us why. The Philippine Children's Medical Center or PCMC apologizes to the Quezon City Police District or QCPD. This is because QCPD personnel and their relatives are among those who receive the controversial Dengvaxia vaccine last September 1st of this year. Ay nararapat lang na dito din ako unang humarap po sa inyo para unay magbigay maghumingi po ng paumanhin dahil sa naidulot na pangamba dahil dito sa anunsyong ibinigay ng Sanupi Pastor tungkol doon sa kanilang uh, produkto. 
based on the figures of the PCMC of the 1,337 recipients of the Dengvaxia vaccine among QCPD personnel. Only 89 or 7% of them have prior infection, while the remaining 93% have no history of the mosquito-borne disease. Experts say the most critically affected by the possible negative effects of the controversial vaccine are children aged 9 to 14 years old. This is a cause of grave concern for PO3 Joyce Helen as she and her two children are among those who received Dengvaxia. Unang-una, siyempre, nag-alala, tapos nalungkot para sa mga bata. Kasi ako, nabigyan din ako eh, kaso nga lang, siyempre, yung anak ko, mas bata. Bale, 10, tsaka 13. Yung mas maliit, wala pa. The PCMC vows to act on the incident. Yesterday, the hospital began its mandatory profiling or the identification of the individuals who received Dengvaxia. They will undergo a five-year monitoring and will receive a card that would serve as their IDs for the medical assistance they will get from the hospital. Para saan man kayong pumuntang health facility, kung nangangailangan ay maipagbigay alam kaagad sa amin para ang monitoring namin at surveillance ay maisakatuparan namin ng naaayon sa direktiba ng Department of Health. Sa pagkakatong ito na lahat may gamagam, ang positive na nakikita natin doon is, is awareness for everybody na dapat wag tayo makagat ang carrier ng dengue. Personnel of the PCMC will also make rounds in regions 3 and 4A as well as in other areas in Metro Manila where the vaccine was administered. Joan Nano, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. The Department of Education or DepEd issues a department order for the monitoring and surveillance of students who receive the controversial Dengvaxia vaccine. With this, DepEd directs all school administrators and school health personnel to review their master list and get the exact number of students injected with, with Dengvaxia. They are also tasked to determine the amount of dosage the students received and if they are experiencing symptoms after the vaccination. The government vows to also intensify its campaign against dengue. It includes the implementation of the 4S strategy, which, which seeks to annihilate the possible breeding ground of mosquitoes in schools. Meanwhile, the Department of Health says it, it might also employ the services of private health care practitioners and personnel of several community-based vaccination programs in identifying the children who receive the Dengvaxia vaccine. Meanwhile, President Rodrigo Duterte has formally requested the Congress to extend martial law in Mindanao. Meanwhile, the two chambers of Congress are expected to hold a joint session on the matter within this week. Rosa Dicos will tell us why. In a five-page letter signed by President Rodrigo Duterte, the chief executive formally requests to Congress to extend martial law in Mindanao from January 1, 2018 to December 31, 2018. The chief executive based this from the recommendations made by the Armed Forces of the Philippines and the Philippine National Police. This is to ensure the eradication of Daesh-inspired Dawatul Islamiya, Waliyatul Masrik, and other local and foreign terrorist groups and communist terrorists, including their protectors, supporters, and financiers. The administration cites that despite the death of Isnilon Hapilon and the Maute brothers, the remnants of their organization are being monitored in their efforts to recruit and train new members. These groups are monitored in central Mindanao, particularly in the provinces of Maguindanao, North Cotabato, Sulu and Basilan, wherein they intensify their violence and try to establish Islamic Caliphate not only in the Philippines but also in the whole of Southeast Asia. Second is the so-called Turaifi group who is allegedly planning to conduct bombings in Cotabato area. Turaifi is said to be the potential successor of Hapilon as Amir in Daesh Wilayat. Third, President Duterte mentioned in his letter the 89 atrocities, including the roadside bombings of Bangsamoro Islamic freedom fighters. Fifteen were conducted in Maguindanao and North Cotabato during martial law period. Fourth is the Abu Sayyaf group who is also a serious security threat and have conducted 43 attacks and acts of terrorism in Basilan, Sulu, Tawi-Tawi and Sambuanga Peninsula, including the killings of eight civilians and beheading of three victims. Fifth and the last reason for martial law extension is the intensified rebellion and atrocities of the Communist Party of the Philippines, New People's Army, National Democratic Front. 
according to House Majority Floor Leader Rep. Rudy Farinas. On Wednesday at 9 in the morning, the Congress and the Senate will convene in a joint session to consider the request of the President to further extend martial law in Mindanao. We're hopeful that Congress would see the need for further extension of martial law, as explained in PRRD's official communication, to finally put an end to the ongoing rebellion in Mindanao. Public safety, after all, is our primordial concern. We must unite against these evil forces. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanã. Former Senator Aquilino Nene Pimentel Jr. believes that the Supreme Court might reject the extension in the implementation of the military rule in Mindanao. Pimentel was one of those who opposed the proclamation of martial law during the term of the late President Ferdinand Marcos. However, he believes the current situation is different from before. He notes that the High Tribunal might determine the basis for the extension of existing martial law in the southern part of the country. Pimentel says it is hard to judge the decision of the president regarding the extension, explaining the chief executive might be holding valuable information the public is not aware of. Uh, the people are free to challenge uh, the existence of martial law in Mindanao and also its possible extension through the courts. Na kung merong abuso sa implementation ng martial law, Dapat sisigaw ang taong bayan. Justice Secretary Vitaliano Aguirre confirms that the Department of Justice is gathering information for the petition it will file before a court to declare the communist rebel New People's Army as a terrorist organization. Aguirre says among the information they are gathering is the violence committed by the NPA against soldiers, policemen, and civilians. Under the country's Human Security Act, the government is required to file a petition declaring a group as a terrorist before a regional trial court. The said court will hear the case first to determine whether or not a group should be formally declared a terrorist. Last week, President Rodrigo Duterte signed a proclamation declaring the NPA as a terrorist group. State witness Robert Katapang links a former Public Works and Highway Secretary Rogelio Singson and former Budget Secretary Florencio Butch Abad in the alleged 8.7 billion peso right-of-way scam. Here's why from Nel Maribojo. The witness in the alleged billion peso work road right-of-way scam in Mindanao region, particularly in General Santos City, appeared before the hearing of the Senate Blue Ribbon Committee and Public Works. According to state witness Robert Katapang, there is a syndicate involving some DPWH officials who claim compensation for the legitimate owners of lands affected by the construction of a national highway. Their alleged modus was to create a fake land title which they would present to the Department of Public Works and Highways so that they could receive their claims. Ang leader po ng ano ng sindikato ay si na Nelson T at saka si Wilma Mamburam. Uh, bali pinipike po ang mga titulo. The contents of the letter support the allegation of our whistleblower Roberto S. Katapang Jr. that numerous transactions involving billions of pesos concerning right-of-way claims before the DPWH are possibly tainted with irregularities. The previous administration released a total amount of 8.7 billion pesos for its right-of-way projects. Because of this, Justice Secretary Vitaliano Aguirre also accuses former DPWH Secretary Roelio Singson and Budget Secretary Florencio Buchabad of being involved in the said anomaly. On the other hand, Singson strongly denies the allegations. But let me say, I did not profit or gain anything from any of these land claims as accused by Secretary Aguirre. There is no 8.7 billion paid in General Santos. I was not a corrupt secretary and definitely not a plunderer. Singson argues many of the filed claim payments were done in 2007 and 2009 when he was not still the DPWH secretary. He said it was in 2012 when ordered they stop in the release of claim payments in Region 12 without validation from the Land Registration Authority. The former DPWH secretary also clarifies that the then administration released more than 2 billion pesos only for the Region 12 right-of-way projects and not 8.7 billion pesos. The current leadership of DPWH, meanwhile, says it also conducting its own investigation on the issue. 
The Senate will resume its investigation on the issue. It will also invite other personalities alleged involved in the said scam. Nel Maribuhok, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. Meanwhile, the Metropolitan Manila Development Authority, or MMDA, admits having difficulty in monitoring the number of passengers on board heavily tinted vehicles. Joe Anano will tell us why. Using a CCTV at its metro base in Makati City, the Metropolitan Manila Development Authority or MMDA personnel strictly monitored the passage of private vehicles with two or more passengers along the fifth lane of EDSA. Aside from CCTVs, traffic enforcers assigned on overpasses have three handicams for clearer video footage of the vehicles. From 6 in the morning to 4.30 in the afternoon today, the MMDA monitored about 1,359 motorists not following the carpool lane policy. The agency admits not being able to determine the number of passengers on board of more than 3,700 heavily tinted private vehicles. The MMD admits it is one of the challenges they are facing in implementing the carpool lane. Yung usapin ng mga cameras namin, baka magkaroon ng konting adjustment. So, yung mga positioning, may mga cameras kasi na pag against the light, hindi mo nakikita yung sa likod. Kami ho, i-maximize lang ho talaga namin yung resources namin. The Land Transportation Office or LTO is the agency in charge of regulating car tints. The LTO previously said it will study anew its regulation in terms of car tints and will release new guidelines regarding the matter. For now, the MMDA will not apprehend motorists violating the carpool lane policy. Meanwhile, the agency's plan to enforce the said policy along EDSA drew flack among netizens. Some netizens argue the carpool lane policy will not be effective since cameras could not capture passengers on the back seat. Some also say the Philippines cannot adopt the traffic system of other countries since Philippine roads are narrower and smaller. The MMDA meanwhile clarifies that the implementation of the carpool lane along EDSA is still under study. Bigyan nyo lang ho kami ng one week, uh, i-assess lang ho natin kapag hindi naman ho sigurado, hindi naman ho para mag-implement ang MMDA ng alangani na polisiya. Should the enforcement of the said policy pushes through, apprehended motorists will face charges of disregarding traffic sign and reckless driving and fines up to 650 pesos. Joan Nano, UNTV News and Rescue, Makati City. Next on Y News. More justices confirmed the Chief Justice Maria Lourdes Sereno caused delays in the transfer of Mauti cases to Metro Manila and the release of benefits to retired justices and judges. Consumer groups urge the Energy Regulatory Board to junk questionable power supply agreements entered into by Meralco. And credit rating agency Fitch upgrades investment grade rating of the Philippines saying the admin drug war does not affect economic improvement. Why News will be right back. Transportation might take into consideration the concerns of public utility drivers and operators in the implementation of the Jeepney Modernization Program. Nel Maribohok will tell us why. Some transport groups have once again expressed their concerns in the implementation of the Jeepney Modernization Program of the Department of Transportation next year. They claim many drivers are concerned that they will lose their livelihood once the program begins. Ang jeepneys ang sumalo sa dapat na tungkulin ng pamahalaan. Ang pinagbabatayan nila doon sa eksamen, yung mga bago ng makina, mga surplus po kami. Baka hindi kami maangkop na lahat kami sa pagdating ng January, walang pumasa doon sa MBIS. Transportation Secretary Arthur Tugade, meanwhile, explains the said program underwent consultation. Tugade argues the groups could not make as an excuse the amount of the modern jeepneys since it cost 1.5 million pesos to 800,000 pesos. The transportation chief explains the jeepney drivers and operators should also not regret the return of investment they can get with the new jeepney models. The DOTR also vows to take into consideration the concerns of various stakeholders in the implementation of the said program. 
Let the river flow. Pupunta at pupunta sila dyan sa moderno pag nakita nila na. Pero ngayon pa lang, idinidikta ang ating ganyan. Hindi hatanggap, mahihirapan tayo. That will be uh, reckoned and deliberated upon oh. and considered within that time frame of three years. Oh. Senator Grace Poe, meanwhile, appeals to the transportation chief to also allow the old jeepney units to operate if these will pass safety standards. Yung sinasabi nila, sports cargo. 20 years vintage, bakit tayo mo paggamit sa akin? Di dumaan ka sa MBIS. Kung road worthy ka dyan, mag-fly ka. So yan, sinabi niyo yan, ha? Um, pagka ang isang jeep dumaan ng MBIS, kahit ng itsura niya iba pa, at pero pumasa siya, tuloy pa rin ang pasada. Ma'am, meron hong standards, ha? Yung pintuan, yung, ha? ha? Yung pintuan ho, ha? hindi sa likod, nasa tagiliran. The Senator urges the DOTR to allow the transport sector to adjust to the new program before fully implementing it. Magkaroon naman muna ng mga pilot projects. No? Hindi pwedeng sabay-sabay lahat ng area pwede. Um, siguro kung compliance sa safety, roadworthiness, at saka yung emissions, uh, pwede munang yon ang unahin. Nel Maribuhok, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. Some Supreme Court justices confirmed that Chief Justice Maria Lourdes Sereno delayed the transfer of Maute cases to Metro Manila from Mindanao and the release of benefits to retired magistrates and court judges in the country. Here's why from Grace Pasi. I believe that the actions done by the Chief Justice from the time that she assumed her position showed no respect nor courtesy to the court and bank. This was how Supreme Court Associate Justice Teresita Leonardo de Castro described Chief Justice Maria Lourdes Sereno in terms of handling cases. During the continuation of the impeachment committee's hearing, as the Associate Justice Noel Tiam confirms some of the allegations stated in the impeachment complaint filed against Chief Justice Sereno. Tiam claims Sereno did not inform the Supreme Court and Bank about the letter of Department of Justice Secretary Vitaliano Aguirre requesting for the immediate transfer of the trial of the multi related cases to Metro Manila due to security issues. The SC Justice says the members of the Anbank learned of the contents of the letter at very late date, which was why they released the decision on the matter two months after DOJ's submission. On June 19, 2017, these are letters which we came to know only after the fact. These letters were never submitted by the Chief Justice to the Anbank. There was a certain degree of mental dishonesty because it did not arise out of a consultation or deliberation by the Anbank. But we are, since he, she called me and told me the end bank has already decided. Supreme Court Administrator Justice Midas Marquez says he even wrote to CJ Sereno to fast track the transferring of the cases after the court officials of Cagayan de Oro refuses to handle the charges due to fears that the rebel groups might take revenge. However, Marquez claims that that magistrate disregarded his request. It is unfortunate that the Chief Justice did not trust the court administrator of the Supreme Court. He did not heed the recommendation of the court administrator. He did not even inform us of such recommendation. And even during lunch, he did not even summon the court administrator. On the other hand, the Camp of Sereno explains, Yung August 8 po, kasi nagkaroon ng pagbabago dun sa recommendation. Yung una pong recommendation kasi, RTC level lang, tas dinagdagan nila ng MTC first level courts. Kaya nagbago yung resolution August 8. Pero on time po yun, walang delay, at hindi po namin malaman kung bakit may ganong questions kasi wala naman pong motibo si Justice, uh, Chief Justice Sereno para i-delay yun. Impeachment committee also discovered that CJ Sereno unilaterally decided to handle the multi-related case, which also did not go through a raffle. There is nothing in the rules that allow her to designate herself as the member in charge, even in administrative matters, whether it is judicial case, whether it is admin case. SC Justices present during the hearing also confirmed that Sereno did not inform the SC and Bank about the issue of benefits of the retired justice and justices in the country. Sereno allegedly let the matter remain unsolved for two years by the special committee and the technical working group she herself formed. Hindi naman po mabagal ang end bank eh. All you have to do is to bring it to the attention of the end bank and we will take action on that. For the said issue to be clarified, Justice Tiham has this call to CJ Sereno. 
I encourage the Chief Justice to attend so that she can explain why she dilly-dallied and decided not to bring it to the attention of the Bank. Meanwhile, colleagues of the Chief Justice couldn't help to express their concerns. Eh, sasabihin ko sa kanya, wala namang kanyanan. You're getting what you want through this devious means. That is not right. Especially if since you are the leader. Limang taon na po, paulit-ulit na akong nag sasabi sa kanya, hindi wag mong gawain 'yan, hindi mo 'yan pwedeng gawain. Hindi pa rin siya tumitigil sa paglabag niya doon sa mga dapat sana ay ina, ina pinaaalam niya sa Enbank. So hanggang kailan kami magtitiis? The impeachment committee will temporarily end the hearing today and will continue it when its session reopens on January 2018. Grace Cassett, UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. For the sixth time, officials from Meralco and Energy Regulatory Commission face the House of Representatives in the continuation of the investigation on the alleged anomalous agreements entered by Manila Electric Company and seven power generation firms. My Bermudes will tell us why. Despite the continuous decline on electricity prices for December, Meralco and the Energy Regulatory Commission are not yet off the hook in the lower chamber. This as the House Committee on Good Government and Public Accountability and House Committee on Energy resumed a probe on the alleged anomalous midnight deals between Meralco and seven power generation companies which allegedly did not undergo competitive selection process. Based on EPIRA law, the government should target to enter power supply Supply agreements or PSAs with companies who can provide the least cost for power consumers. Bayan Muna Partalist Representative Carlos Zarate, the lawmaker who submitted the resolution on the investigation of the questionable agreements, said that the ERC received the PSA applications on April 29, 2016, at past five in the afternoon, which is beyond office hours and already past the deadline set by the commission. But when asked if the agreements are predatory or the deals are overpriced, the ERC defends they are following certain guidelines to determine which generation companies can provide the least cost. We are at ERC have specific guidelines on that. Power and consumer groups meantime asked the House panel to junk the applications as soon as possible and pave way for a reform in the agency. Para ito sa susunod na uh, demand ng kuryente, um, uh, in the next period kasi itatayo pa nila itong mga coal plants. Ang maging implication nito, kapag ni-reject ito ng, uh, ng House at ng uh, uh, ERC, ang implication nito ay mababang kuryente para sa mga consumers. Bakit? Na? Dahil once, if this will be rejected, then it will, it will the ERC will have to do the process. Rivera adds consumers will be directly hit if the agreements are given a thumbs up and it will be a big slap for the lawmakers who handles the probe in case those were approved. My Bermudez, UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. The former chief of the, the abolished PNP anti-illegal drug group, Police Senior Superintendent Albert Ferro, calls on the public to give him another chance to prove his competence in fighting illegal drugs. Here's why from Ray Pelayo. Police Senior Superintendent Albert Ferro says he did not anticipate his designation as the chief of the anti-drug unit of the Philippine National Police or PNP. It can be recalled the then PNP anti-illegal drugs group was abolished after the abduction and killing of Korean national Ji Ik Ju, which involved some of Ferro's men. The new PNP anti-drug unit head thanked the leadership of the PNP for trusting him anew. He vows to fix their system so that its Kalawag policemen can no longer infiltrate the PNP Drug Enforcement Group or PNP DEG. I, I do subscribe to the tinatawag na 6 W's. Ano? Uh, what, what went well, what went wrong. So we have to examine and uh, come up with a good uh, safeguards come up with a good uh, uh, reform or a come up with a good inventory ng ating ano, inventory ng ating uh, mga magagandang uh, practices, mga tactics and then possibly 
I will anchor it on the two type of uh, two type of uh, principle. Ferro calls on the public to give them another chance to prove their dedication to their job. According to the police official, one proof of their sincerity is their effort to resolve the GHU case where Police Superintendent Rafael Domlao was allegedly involved. Pong nais ko rin pong ipaabot na I was part ng kung paano na-solve yung case na yun at hindi po natin tinago yung katotohanan kasi ang bili ng Pangulo ay sabihin natin yung katotohanan. Pero also urged the public to help the PNP fight illegal drugs. Tataasan pa po natin yung antas kung kung yun ay ito'y nagagawa natin ay, at with most uh, caution sa lahat ng bagay na gagawin natin. Ito po ay, ay hindi laban lang ng polis. Ito po ay laban nating lahat ng Pilipino. The new head of the PNP DEG warns a new, the police unit's personnel planning to commit anomalies. Ferro also notes his men will use body cameras in all their operations to provide transparency to the public. The PNP DEG concentrates in neutralizing high-value targets and in reducing the supply of illegal drugs. Ray Pilayo, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Meanwhile, the Association of Women Legislators Foundation Incorporated of the House of Representatives donated 12,000 pesos to each family of the 23 soldiers and policemen killed in the clashes against terrorists in Marawi City. The donation came from the revenues collected from a garage sale and other fundraising activities conducted by the said foundation. Overall, the foundation donated more than 1,900,000 pesos to 159 families of the deceased members of the armed forces of the Philippines and seven families of left by the members of the PNP Special Action Force. Pinaparating namin sa mga naulilang pamilya ng mga magigiting nating mga sundalo at kapulisan na nasa Wisa, Marawi. Ang aming pakikiramay Paghanga at tauspusong pasasalamat. In other news, there is no indication that the anti-drug war of the Duterte administration affects investors' confidence according to the Fitch credit ratings. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. The credit ratings of the Philippines is upgraded from triple B negative to triple B based on the latest report of Fitch ratings. Fitch credit ratings pertain to the opinion on the relative ability of an entity to meet financial commitments. Based on the statement of the Fitch ratings, the sentiment of investors remains strong because of continuous solid demand and foreign direct investments. This indicates that the controversies that administration's anti-drug war is facing do not affect investors' confidence. Fitch is also expecting higher government spending under the Build, Build, Build infrastructure program of the administration. Also, Fitch forecasts GDP growth of 6.8% in 2018 and 2019, which will maintain the Philippines among the fastest growing economies in Asia Pacific region. Malacanang welcomes the Fitch findings. Based on the statement of Presidential Communications Secretary Martin Andanar, this affirms that the Duterte administration is in the right direction of implementing its anti-crime and corruption programs to maintain law and order as well as implementing the economic policies of the government. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanang. A former finalist of the third season of a Song of Praise or Asok Music Festival on TV has made a successful comeback. Robby de Guzman will tell us why. One of the most popular songs during the Song of Praise or Asok Year 3 was Kislap. It was composed by Oliver Nara and interpreted by Jessamy Gabon. Yesterday, the duo were able to win the songwriting competition anew with their entry entitled Ang Pangako Mo or Your Promise. The entry won in the weekly elimination of the ASOP Year 7 for the month of December. Yung paramdam na excited ulit kasi dito na naman sa ASOP. Kasi yung ASOP, ano ko to eh. Mga ito yung pinakasimula ko talaga. Hindi ako natuto ng mga songwriting techniques. Po, parang day job po, parang ganun po. Pero kasi ano eh, uh, in, actually hindi ko masyadong nire-relate to that kasi nga ano eh, wala naman eh, kumbaga sa performance pa rin magbabase. Pero yun nga po, it, it was fun na ganun yung nangyayari. The judges were entertained by the song entry. Ito, 
Ganda, I really like the song. Kasi, it's very now. Uh, it's a type of song that I can actually imagine hearing on the radio. Pang, it will blend right in. Ano bang masasabi ko dito? Ang ganda-ganda nung kanta, ang ganda-ganda pa ng pagkakanta. A really, really very catchy tune. Meron ako na, nadinig na magandang chord doon sa kalahati ng bridge, ha? Ayos yan. Approve ulit. Ang pangako mo defeated other entries like Tumawag sa Diyos, which was composed by another former ASOP grand finalist, Roland Delfin, and the entry Home, composed by Mark Arthur Padilla, a Filipino worker in Finland. Robbie de Guzman, UNTV, News and Rescue, Quezon City. Coming up on Y News. The United States, Japan, and South Korea begins two-day missile tracking drills amid tensions with North Korea. Six teams fail to advance to the second round eliminations of the UNTV Cup Season 6. And the Hong Kong contestant wins Taiwan's Space Out competition by doing nothing for 90 minutes. More from my news after this break. Six teams fail to advance to the second round eliminations of the UNTV Cup Season 6. Meanwhile, a debuting team, the Pidea Drug Busters, has something to celebrate after a match this Sunday. Victor Cosare will tell us why. <laughs> Oh, wow, Rookie team Pidea Drug Busters eases to the second round eliminations of the League of Public Servants. This as the DOJ Justice Boosters toppled the Ombudsman Graft Busters 95-73 on Sunday's triple header. Based on the UNTV Cup point system, the DOJ Ombudsman and DA Foodmasters get eliminated from the league this season while Pidea reaches the next round. Meanwhile, Group A's DOH Health Achievers, Koa Enablers and BFP Firefighters also exit the games. Pascual, Umboyan, sa ilalim. Yep. In the AFP DOH hard court battle, the AFP Cavaliers defeated the DOH Health Achievers 92-71. With this, the soldiers shared a 5-1 win-loss standing with the Senate defenders in Group A. On the floor, Banzali. Wow, what body control. And in the GSIS PNP match, the UNTV Cup crowd saw an impressive win by the GSIS Furies over the defending champion PNP responders 76-68. Uh, win nila, talagang tinrabaho nila ng gusto. Kasi hindi namin inisip na we're in sa second round. Eh. Sabi ko, isolidify pa natin, Ma makachamba tayo against the defending champion PNP. This win catapults the Furies to the third spot in Group A with four games won and two games lost, surpassing the responders, which now has a 3-3 win-loss standing. Rene Boy Banzali and James Patrick Abugan were hailed as the best players of the game after bucketing 54 combined points. The second round eliminations of the UNTV Cup Season 6 kicks off on Thursday, December 14. Victor Cosare, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. The local government of Camarines Sur is now preparing for the thousands of Chinese tourists and other foreign nationals who are expected to visit the province. Ray Pelayo will tell us why. Wakeboarding in the Kamsur Water Sports Complex. Beautiful beaches and other scenic views in Karamuan. These are just some of the tourist attractions in Camarines Sur. According to Governor Miguel Abix Villafuerte, the local government is in talks with several travel operators in China that can bring about 50,000 Chinese tourists in the province. The provincial government plans to build, among others, the so-called Kamsur Tourism Center, which is worth 60 million pesos. The said tourism center is expected to bring job opportunities, especially to the youth. 
ang hamon lang nila, Chinese ready ba ang Camarines Sur? Meaning, may mga translators ba kayo dyan? May mga Chinese signages ba kayo dyan? So yan po ang uh, i-incorporate po natin dun sa bagong tourism building. Meanwhile, Chris Hoff of the CWC says the 200-hectare Kamsur Water Sports Complex or CWC will always have foreign tourist visitors. It can be noted the CWC also hosted the World Championship Wakeboarding. Three to six months is probably the average stay for, the, for most foreign guests um, just because of the weather and because of the park itself. Furthermore, the youngest governor in the country notes the tourism sector brings additional revenue to the province. Nagdadagdag po yan kasi lahat po yan provincial owned ng almost over 100 million pesos additional income da sa provincial government na nakakapag-translate po sa mas maraming scholars, mas maraming projects at iba pa. Last year, the province of Camarines Sur in Bicol recorded more than 2.4 million tourist arrivals. Ray Pilayo, UNTV, News and Rescue, Camarines Sur. A Hong Kong student survived the scorching heat and annoying flies to win an unusual competition in Taiwan. Here's why from Nina or Emilio. Contestants from Taiwan and abroad fought for the title of Space Out King on Sunday by doing nothing for a duration of 90 minutes. The crown for the fifth international Space Out competition was won by a 24-year-old contestant from Hong Kong who said the hardest obstacle to overcome was the hot weather and bright sun, along with flies that continued to bother him throughout the course of the contest. But I have to keep reminding myself, I have to... I have to focus on the current stage and empty my mind and yeah, I try my best to keep this, keep this all up in this uh, entire time. Yeah. About 80 contestants spent the entire time sitting still and staring into space without talking, sleeping, eating or using any electronic devices under the slogan of Relax Your Brain. The competition was first held in Seoul, South Korea in 2014 and is meant to remind of the many distractions people living in modern cities are faced with today and to let the contestants overcome a feeling of anxiousness when forced to do nothing. Ninya Armilio, UNTV, News and Rescue. Those are the reasons behind the news, December 11, 2017. I'm Angelo Castro III. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I am William Theo. And I'm Darlene Basingan because we need to know... We will always ask why. Thank you for watching Why, why News.